So this journey began about 12 years ago, uh, on April 1st, 2007, to be exact. Uh, I, a, the article uh, was written for the LA Times, which arrived at my house. Uh, I opened it up, started reading. Uh, it was written by a, a former Salt Lake City librarian named Chip Ward. Uh, Chip uh, has written a, a couple of books. He's known now more as, as a, a conservationist and activist uh, and lives off the grid in Utah. But at the time, he was um, retiring and the essay was about how uh, libraries have now become de facto homeless shelters and how librarians are forced into being first responders and basically all the things that they didn't go to library school for they're now uh, uh, they're now in, in you know in the process of, of of being in the middle of uh, in 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 their public library and so I was inspired by the story I was certainly moved by it and I had done the bulk of my research for Bobby at the downtown branch of of LAPL um, but I wasn't convinced that it was had gotten as bad as Chip Ward was talking about so I went back to the library started walking around and in fact it was uh, and I over time I started to imagine what a story might look like if the patrons decided to stage an old uh, 60s style sit-in, how the media would react, how politicians would spin it, how law enforcement would, would react, and would they continue to criminalize the poor, and, and how ultimately we would unwind it uh, finally with the script that we shot using nonviolent civil disobedience as, uh, as, as a way to, to diffuse the situation. So the, the, the development of the script really took 10 years. Uh, I had written a script, uh, a version of it, uh, that we were gonna shoot in 2008, but the financial crisis hit, uh, we lost our funding, and in many ways I'm grateful uh, for that because the, it was a different story it was a much darker story, and I think that uh, it wouldn't have been the film that it is now. And I think that in many ways, it's wildly more relevant now, even considering what we just experienced with the polar vortex a few weeks ago, uh, descending on the middle of the country, and we literally had people freezing to death on the streets. Yeah, so I, I wrote a book called The Librarian's Guide to Homelessness, and one day I got a, a Facebook friend request from, from this guy, and I, I thought it was my buddy Dave messing with me, so I, I think I typed a nasty message initially, but it turned out to actually be Emilio. And so Facebook led to email, led to phone calls, led to, hey, why don't you come out to the, to the Santa Barbara Film Festival? And during the Q&A after the, the, one of the screenings there, there was a question about homelessness, and, and Emilio invited me up to, to come and give the answer, and, and he said, hey, that worked kind of well, we should do that again. And, you know, 30 screenings of the That's movie right. later, right. 20 cities later, whatever it is, uh, here we are. So, so in addition to writing The Librarian's Guide to Homelessness, my, my day job is I run a, a very large homeless shelter. And so I, I spend a lot of time working with libraries and talking to libraries and seeing this, that, that libraries, we tend to think of libraries as a place for homeless individuals to go because they're, they're warm during the winter and, and, and dry and whatnot. But it's also much wider than that, in that libraries are everything that homelessness is not. It's semi-orderly, it's, it's relatively calm and quiet, uh, there's a decent amount of space, and so it really is a respite from homelessness for individuals who are, who are struggling. Oh man, uh, it, it would be really hard to dial in to any one particular character in the film and say that one is my favorite. I do like uh, the fact that you know not everybody has a transformation in this movie. There are two that really are transformed, and I would say Big George, uh, played by uh, Che Rhymefest Smith, who is uh, known as a rapper. Uh, he wrote uh, the Glory song for the film Selma with Common and, and uh, John Legend. And so he was in a documentary, he was a focal point of a documentary called In My Father's House. And it was about his uh, uh, reconnecting to his father who was on the street for 30 years. And uh, he didn't know him. So when he finally connected with his dad, uh, his dad only would agree to meet him at the local public library because that's where he felt safe. Made this documentary called In My Father's House. I saw it and I thought, I think this man can act. 
So I called him up and uh, he said, I'm, I'm game, let's do it. He also wrote three tracks for the film, the opening title track and then the two tracks, uh, original tracks at the end. So it's a long answer to your question. I love watching the transformation of George in this. So I would say he is a favorite character of mine. Jenna Malone, has she gets woke during the course of the film. Uh, I'd say I, I enjoy watching her full arc and, and getting uh, and, and her awakening. Um, Michael, Michael K. Michael K. His depiction like, <laughs> of, of homelessness right. and the full humanity right. is just it's, it's breathtaking. Yeah. No, it's, he's it's really. He's, I, I think Michael K. steals the movie. Uh, I think his energy is just wildly unpredictable, and you know he's and he's like this warrior poet philosopher uh, who just you know he he sees everything, he gets everything. Uh, he doesn't necessarily know how to solve it all, but uh, but he definitely is a. Um, He's a catalyst for how it all starts to un unravel and unwind. It's crazy. One of my favorite scenes in the movie is when you're on the phone. I'm not going to give too much away. And he's <coughs> telling you what to, t what That's to right. say. And he won't take the, the That's phone right. From you. Right. And I right. think that was just a really nice dynamic. He wants to lead, but he doesn't want to lead. Exactly. Right? He doesn't want to put himself in the crosshairs because he knows what that means. Uh, and of course, he doesn't understand what Stuart's background is. And as he's dragging him into it, uh, he's exposing him in ways that he never thought he would be, frankly. First time I watched this movie back at the Santa Barbara Film Festival, I was, I was terrified. I thought, oh no, he's going to screw it up, he's going to get it wrong. Hollywood always gets it wrong. Because Hollywood always, uh, they either take homeless individuals and they package up every stereotype into one person for just as a gag, or they take this idea of the, the noble poor person who's perfect and smells like roses and has never made a bad mistake. And, and neither of those are human. But this movie, uh, particularly driven by Michael, Michael K. Williams' character, but, but also more broadly, it humanizes homelessness in a way that movies rarely get right, in that there's the full dimension of, of humanity there. There's, there's humor, there's, there's sadness, there's some anger in there, there's excitement. All those the human emotions that, that everyone experiences, including individuals experiencing homelessness, are, are, are captured in this movie, and that just, that just doesn't happen. And so I'm, I'm over the moon at the depiction of homelessness in, in this movie. And other homeless advocacy groups have really chimed in as well. And, and we've actually also screened it for individuals experiencing homelessness in Houston, in, in Aurora. In Aurora. I mean, it's, it's, and they have seen themselves on screen. We, they're empowered, right? We showed it at the shelter I run, and, uh, and Emilio asked them, you know, how did I do? And one guy goes, oh, yeah, that's us, right? <laughs> And the same thing could be said for librarians. Yes. And the first time that we took the, because Ryan's book had come out last year, uh, and, the, and I wanted to test drive the film at the ALA con, uh, uh, convention in New Orleans. I don't know what I was thinking, but I, I felt that if librarians actually thought that, uh, that we stuck the landing and, and we did well on this film, that we would get their, their vote of approval. All, it could have also gone pear-shaped. and uh, could have gone badly. And the first question that came out of the, uh, the Q&A and the first screening, because there were three, was how did you get us so right? Yeah. And I breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> I thought, okay, okay. They're on, they're on board. There is a lot of, uh, a lot of detail in the, in the movie as it pertains to libraries and librarians, and I think people will recognize that as libraries and librarians. Well, and that's been one of the things, exciting things about watching it with different audiences. Sometimes we're watching it with librarians, sometimes with individuals experiencing homelessness, sometimes with social workers, and everybody picks up on something different. Everybody right. sees themselves and, and their world represented in it. And it's just fascinating to watch the different groups. And the nuances, they, yeah. they kind of, they, they, it, it shifts. Yeah. We watch it shift and, and you'll say, you know, they're laughing because, you know, they get this joke because, mm -hmm. and, and really kind of, you know, detailing it out as to what they're responding to because that is what they see in their, in their daily lives. Well, Rebecca, I'm sorry, Anne Lamott uh, says that, it's a great quote, she says, um, communities without libraries are like radios without batteries. Uh, and there's a book out recently published by, um, written by Eric Kleinenberg called Palaces of the People. And what Eric, uh, uh, talks about specifically is how libraries are the cornerstone of what he's coined the social infrastructure and that rather than privatizing and dismantling and defunding we need to double down on them because they are important if not vital to uh, a thriving democracy. Yeah. 
And I think that that role in democracy is, is further underscored by the fact that, that libraries are one of the last public spaces where all the different socioeconomic groups come together in one place. And, and when middle class individuals and wealthy individuals never get to interact and be in the same room with individuals in poverty or homelessness, they make really lousy policy decisions. And so our democracy desperately needs more places like the library and specifically the library in order to, 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 for our, our country to thrive. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. No, go see the movie on April 5th. I mean, I think it's uh, you know part of what we're doing now with this grassroots movement uh, of screening the film city by city, uh, getting the feedback, is that we're hopeful that, that the grassroots movement is then supported by a more mainstream uh, media push that we do in New York next week. And we hope between the two, uh, we've been able to get out there and, and, and give this movie the push that it deserves. The, the, this movie, is, it's, it's an important movie, but it's also just a really good movie. And so it, it's, you know, I think people think libraries, homelessness, oh, watching that's going to be like eating kale. No, this is a really funny, endearing, sweet movie. And, and so just go see it.